So the topic today is uh, sequence models. Uh, what are sequence models? They, these are models that have, a, have the quality that you feed in a sequence, one sequence, they think over it, and after thinking over it, they produce another sequence, right? So for example, uh, you can feed in, let's take an illustration, you can feed in uh, English text and you might be expecting a French translation to come out. These are the quintessential examples people give of that. Or uh, sometimes you can say, I'll feed in some text and I expect a summary to come out or things like that. Now, the quality of these sequence models is they need to be contextual. Like for example, the, when you translate a word, in a, the words in a sentence to uh, another language, the, in another language, the sequence of the words is different from the sequence of the words in the original language, isn't it? So uh, for example, um, I don't know, uh, if you say, uh, well, I, unfortunately, there's only one language uh, that I can speak other than English well. So uh, let's take a statement. The cow, having, uh, having enjoyed uh, uh, a lot of carrots, jumped over the moon in delight. Right? I'm just concocting a sentence. Now, when you say uh, the cow, having eaten a lot of carrots, jumped over the moon in delight or something like that. Um, you would say, when you write it in Hindi, I'll let you do it in your own mind, you will see that the word sequences are different. You know, it is different. It is not a literal word to word translation and then laying it out. That would not make sense or in French or in any other language that you are familiar with. Try to translate the sentence into that language. You'll realize that it doesn't work. So the question comes, how do you therefore deal with these situations? If it was simple word-to-word -word translation, it would be very easy. You may probably not even need uh, <coughs> a neural network. You can just look up a dictionary, right? And just do a translation. So when people tried to do that, the first thing that came about was something called a recurrent neural network. They're very fascinating architectures. They have uh, inherently an autoregressive quality uh, that we will talk about in a little bit. Now, when you have uh, the technology of recurrent neural networks, they were very popular for quite some time. A lot of applications everywhere. Even today, they're very, very popular for a lot of use cases. You could do for forecasting. For example, a sequence could be um, the weather data, the temperature data for the past few hours, days, whatever it is. And you're trying to predict the upcoming uh, temperature in the next few days. Right? As another sequence, I give you the sequence of past temperature data, and I ask you to predict the temperature in the coming days, in the, not just tomorrow, but a whole, um, a whole week or 10 days or something like that. So for these things, these recurrent neural networks were doing very well. Now, how, the way the recurrent neural networks work, I will explain today in the first hour, when we are doing the recurrent neural networks, we'll do it in pieces. I will cover the base recurrent neural network. Then there are two improvements upon the recurrent neural network. They are called the LSTM and GRU. These are popular architectures. They take the idea a little bit further and I'll explain how they carry the idea forward. Once we have done that, we will then Look at the limitations of these uh, recurrent neural networks uh, and LSTMs and GRUs. So when I use the word recurrent neural networks today, take it in a much more broad sense, take it to include the simple recurrent neural networks, which we'll talk about today, as well as these uh, things, LSTM and GRU. Now, if you look at the literature of deep learning, you'll find the word LSTM and the word GRU, they are pervasive, they're just about everywhere. Right. And it speaks to the fact that for a lot of time, a lot of problems could be solved using these recurrent architectures. Therefore, it is very important that we uh, learn about these architectures properly. 
We also learn about their limitations. Why is it, uh, where is it that they don't work? Then after that, after that hour of uh, conversation, we'll get into a new topic called attention. It turns out that the way to remove some of the limitations of recurrent neural networks is using uh, the concept of attention. It turns out attention is a very old concept. It was, uh, <coughs> I believe the first paper on attention was uh, 2014, right about the time when recurrent neural networks are taking off. So, but they had a parallel development and they showed that if you couple rec attention to recurrent neural networks, you remove some of the limitations of the recurrent neural network. Then came another breakthrough, which was a landmark breakthrough. That breakthrough came in a paper that was submitted by Google for, uh, to the archives um, in December, 2017 and really got to be talked about in early 2018. That paper start, starts with a very provocative name title. It says, attention is all you need. And that itself is uh, thought provoking. What would they mean when they say, attention is all you need? What they showed is that you don't need recurrent neural networks at all to deal with a lot of sequence model problems you can solve it just using an attention mechanism or the self-attention mechanism. So we will do that. It's a very clever architecture they create in which they make the recurrent neural networks redundant and for, for this sort of sequence uh, uh, models. And you just get away just by using the uh, attention mechanism. That particular art is called the transformer architecture. Transformers are dominant. Uh, in day, yesterday's lab, for example, we saw how important transformers are, how powerful they are. You could probably see that for a variety of tasks, you can just take this pre-trained transformers, do transfer learning, apply it to your context. And usually it works very well or works well with a little bit of fine tuning and so forth. So today I'll be shaping the discussions gradually towards transformers. But before I go to transformers, I would like to take a little bit more historic path and it is still important to cover recurrent neural networks. They are still quite, quite useful and uh, prevalent. Then we'll talk about attention and then we'll talk about uh, uh, transformers. Now today when I do the transformer, I will do the classic paper of 2017 December Attention is all you need. We'll cover that paper in detail. But <clears throat> the specific implementations, for example, that we were using yesterday, BERT and this and that, uh, those things, uh, there are many, many implementations. It's almost like um, there's an explosion of implementations of transformers. We will cover on Sunday in the research paper, in the paper reading section, we will cover BERT, which was a very influential implementation of the transformer. BERT and GPT-2 are two very big implementations. Um, then there are other implementations too. For example, there's still BERT, Robert II, and so on and so forth. There are many, many implementations. And they all have their uh, pluses and minuses. S Saturday, or sorry, Sunday, time permitting, we'll look at the trade-offs and uh, aspects of it. Also BART and this and that. But let's focus on the concepts uh, today. Right. So to summarize today, we'll cover three topics. We'll cover recurrent neural networks, which includes LSTMs and GIUs. We'll cover attention, and then we'll cover transformers. In particular, we will do the paper, attention is all you need. Are we clear guys about the scope now? So if that is clear, let me go there and let me do a few mathematical uh, preliminaries before I proceed. Um, start by first taking a page and that gets the pen closer to me. So first I would like to use or sort of introduce two concepts. One is softmax. Some of you may be familiar with it, uh, but some of you may not, or you may have seen it and used it sort of in code, but may not 
see or get to the bottom of the mathematical implications of it. So we will study what softmax is. And we'll also look at another concept, which I will call the dot product. Now, the dot product is something that you have, of course, learned in your school in college days, but we'll look at it from a, like sort of, it will be a review and I'll point out a couple of features that to us is very relevant. So um, what is softmax? The word softmax, when we use in uh, neural networks or in uh, machine learning, it's actually a misnomer. What it should be called is, uh, I don't know, arc, soft arc max max or arg, well, arg, it's a soft arg max is probably the better way of putting it. This, this little piece uh, which explains what it is, is usually omitted. <coughs> and uh, many, many people I believe have complained about it that I wish we did not have this mis uh, misleading notation, but the idea is very simple. Suppose you have a bunch of numbers uh, I will use the word energies. And I'll illustrate it with this concept. Suppose you have some neural networks and you give it some input and they are all producing at the end of it, uh, what they are doing is, let us say that this neural network will tell you uh, how uh, like a predict how much, how, how strongly it is voting in favor of some, for a cow, let's say. Right? And this is doing the same thing for a duck. And this is doing the same thing for a horse. And this is doing the same thing for what should we take? We have already taken cow, duck, horse. Let's take some bird, right? A cow, duck, horse. So what happens is that, let's say that there's some code that is here and it is producing, and each of these is coming out with certain strength. And so let's say that this number for cow is, uh, I will just take a random number, let's say two, <coughs> does positive or negative. Let's say the duck is minus one, horse is 0 0.5, and a bird is, uh, let us say, 0 0.7, right? And so you need, to you need to ask yourself, together, given the fact that these, each of these um, in in independent nodes, uh, they are only focused on what they are looking for, cow, duck, horse, bird, and uh, they are producing what in, the, uh, what in this uh, world, we, in this world of deep learning, we call the energies. These are the energies, right? And from energies, what we want to do is we want to pick the correct answer because if you are doing classification, classification does not look for these energies. What does classification look for? It is looking for a label, isn't it? What you need is a label, cow here. The answer should be cow because this is big. Are we, make, are we making sense, guys? And what we want ideally is we want probably we want these energies to be converted to probabilities. These probabilities go from zero to one, right? If you look at the probability, probability of it not being. And what you want is the probability of cow plus the probability of a duck, um, cow plus probability of a duck, plus the probability of a horse, plus the probability of a bird. What should it all add up to? One. One. Exactly. One. Means oh, that wow. thing is either is one of these four. You can't say none of the above, right? So uh, in in this classification problem, you have set it, and this is the sanity check. They should all add up to one. So now the question is, how do you take these numbers and you convert them to probabilities? There, there is there are many ways that you could do that, but uh, one way that you could do, if I say, is that see first we need to get positive values. You can just square it or do something or the other. But one easy way that you could do is first exponentiate each of these numbers. So e to the two is for cow, e to the minus one is for duck, 
e to the 0 0.5 is for the horse, right? Well, bird does not look like a cow, certainly. So I'll make it um, minus um, three, let us say, huh? uh, e to the minus three for bird. Are we together? Now, <clears throat> when you do that, when you exponentiate numbers, uh, what will the numbers look like? Will they be all, uh, will you still have negative numbers left? What is e to the negative number? It's just a small positive. It's just a small number between zero and one, right? This will be a number beyond one, like it will be, e square will be approximately nine, I believe, right? And this will be, uh, this will be one over 27, that will be three percent, very small. So, <clears throat> uh, all of these, they add up to uh, numbers greater than zero, greater than equal to zero. That part is clear. And now what we need to do is we, how do we convert it to a probability? We can do it using a trick by saying, let's do one thing. Let us take the, the, each of these values and divide it by the total of all of this, e2 plus e to the minus one plus e to the uh, e to the plus 0 0.5 plus e to the minus three. So in other words, you sum up these uh, energies in the bottom. When you sum it up, what will happen? Each of these will become a proportion of the whole, isn't it? Each value here will become a proportion of the whole. Uh, are we together, guys? Yes. Yeah. It will become a, and we can do that. We can, uh, like maybe in the break, or uh, depends upon how much time we have. It would be illustrative to do this in a Jupyter notebook and see how this works. So what happens is not only that, because it's a proportion, it will now take values between zero and one. And so we accomplished our task. We converted these values into probabilities. P cow, P duck, P horse, P bird, right? They become that, these things. Once you divide it by the total, they become probabilities. So this thing, this thing is called, <coughs> this is, uh, and this is where the confusion comes, this exponentiation. So in other words, the probability of a cow is the energy of the cow, whatever the energy of the cow was produced, which in this case was two, let us say two, divided by some of the energies of <coughs> each of the instances, right? Does this make sense? The probability of the cow is e to the cow divided by uh, e to the, all the other energies summed up, all other, all energies summed up. That is what we have done here, isn't it? Uh, more generally, we can say probability of a class uh, J or class I, let us say, class I is e to the energy for I. So let me just use the word Y. Let me call these energies YI, huh? YI hat in some sense. Y, let me just keep, call it YI. So it will be YI divided by sum over <coughs> e to the y, j, all possible values of j, including the value i. This is your expression for the probability. Am I making sense, guys? This is how you can convert any bunch of numbers into, you can give it proportionate probabilities based on their size. Together, guys? Yes, sir. But you may ask this question, well, why, why did I exponentiate it? There are other ways of converting numbers to positive. So that is actually quite interesting. When you play this game, you will realize that E squared, you know, the two energy, the probability of cow will be approximately, or as far as I remember, when you actually do this, you'll find that this is greater than 90%. Probability of the next biggest thing, horse, will actually be somewhere close to, and if one of you have a, <coughs> a calculator, you can quickly do this. Um, probability of a horse will be small. Probability of a, a duck, very, very small. 
and probability of a bird will be approximately zero. Right? So it amplifies the answer. What it does is given a cow's result, which is two, given a duck's result, which is minus one, the horse result, which is 0 0.5, and a bird result, bird energy, which is minus three, what it does is that when you soft max it, you notice that this here, this blows up, it becomes huge. This becomes small, this becomes a little bit there, and this is practically zero, right? So it makes the big value stand out. Are we together, guys? Right? So now that it stands out, now comes the question. What do you want to do when you use this for classification? So for classification, what do you want to do? You want to pick the guy with the biggest probability, isn't it? The class with the biggest probability. So you want to pick that argument class, class, what is it? That maximizes the this this function, right? Maximizes the uh, this thing, y i. So you want to find that i. What is it? I that maximizes this thing, e to the y i divided by summation of uh, e to the y j, sum of all j. Now, do you see how we write this mathematical expression? <clears throat> We are saying which thing is it, which index is it? Let's say i is equal to zero, i is equal to one for duck, i is equal to two for this, i is equal to three for that, right? What is it, right? Or maybe i is equal to just literally cow, duck. Let me just use it like this. i is equal to cow here, i is equal to duck eyes. So which value of i maximizes this thing? And what would be your answer here? It would be? Cow. Which class maximizes it here? Cow. Cow, right? Obviously, the cow maximizes it for you. So you say that <clears throat> I want to find that class which maximizes this uh, function, which is a probability associated with it based on the energies. And that argmax of this has a misnomer name. It is soft max, right? Uh, people call it the soft max function. Softmax. So what the softmax does is for all the, like when you give it a, a vector of numbers, like here, we give it a vector of numbers, right? Two minus one or 0 0.5. Actually, let me spell it out. Two minus one. What else did I give? 0 0.5 minus three. What will it do? It will single out this index. So it will say Z, this index, which happens to belong to a cow. So it will say cow, right? Uh, zero. Um, Asif, how would it single it out? It would just have a higher value, right? Among all the- Yes, yes. So it will pick the highest the highest value, highest probability, I but think. But it won't actually automatically pick it, right? Like we'll have to write some code to pick it out, right? Um, the answer to that is yes and no, based on which library you're looking at. Um, Generally, what happens is when you apply the softmax, depending upon how the library is implemented, it will take you this far. And then you will have to say, like for example, uh, if you say torch in PyTorch dot max, right? right. Max, tor torch dot max of already something that has gone through a softmax. So let's say that the softmax has come out. Uh, this, what it will return you is two things. It will return you the value and the index. Right, so it will be, isn't it kind of arg max of soft max? It is actually arg soft max, arg max of soft max. And that is what makes the thing. See, you don't use the word soft max. The soft exponentiation does nothing but just exponentiates it, right? It just exponentiates it and makes it into probabilities. Yeah. Then you pick the largest one. When you pick the largest one, you get the cow and the index of the cow. 
Yes, that's why it's a misnomer. That's why it's a misnomer. It's very hard to, and when you, people have written libraries, right? And this is where mathematicians get a little bit irritated. If you look at, for example, SciSkipi dot special. So for example, if you want to do this in code, all you have to do is import skip from, from, SciPy, from SciPy, import softmax. So now when you give to softmax, if you do softmax, let me bring it up. Softmax, this, this array to uh, minus one, 0 0.5, minus three, this array, it will actually return you an array of probabilities, isn't it? 0 0.9, I'm just taking a guess. I don't know what it is. You guys have to do it. All you have to do is write this one line code and you'll figure it out in Jupyter what it is. So I'll just say something, 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 right? Now you need to go pick this number. Sorry, uh, let me write it there, 0 0.9 something. So then what you have to do is you have to pick this. Am I together? And um, PyTorch takes the same attitude. What it does is when you do the softmax, it will produce the energies. Uh, I mean, it will produce the probabilities. And now you'll have to do torch.max to find out, okay, <laughs> which, what is the value? What is the index, right? So it will be like cow is the value. Index happens to be zero. So is there a softmax in torch? Yeah, 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 torch dot. I'm talking about the soft dust, uh, torch dot softmax. It does exactly the same oh, thing as scipy, numpy, et cetera do. So PyTorch has taken a lot of pains to be compatible with well-known scientific computing libraries. So guys, so let's summarize what we learned. Uh, soft softmax is a bit of a misnomer, but it just helps you create a from energies or from energies or simply think of numbers. Numbers as list or array or tensor, whatever you want to call it. It produces, maybe not, let me just use the word vector because it's a one dimensional, it vector. It produces probabilities using this expression, using um, this thing. Probability of i is equal to e to the y i over summation over e to the uh, y j for all values of j. This, using this formula, it will produce another array of probabilities. And then you can pick the best one. And its quality is that it makes the big guy really stand out. Do you see this? Uh, this cow here is big and compared to it, this duck and these horse probabilities, they look vanishingly small. So it shines a light on the big value. That's one metaphor I can use. Shines a light, shines a strong light, accent light, on the biggest value. That is the intuition behind the softmax. In a whole list of numbers, it will make the big one stand out really well. So far, so good, guys? Uh, one question, Asif. Yes. Uh, if we just take a look at this uh, four values, then we already know the number two is the largest among all. So logically, one would say, why do we need to even run the softmax? You can just pick. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a very good question, actually. Thanks for asking. See, what happens is that when you do classification and <clears throat> people not only want to know which is the bigger, Sometimes they want to know the probabilities. They want it as probabilities. The reason they want it is as sometimes they may pick two answers if they are big enough. For example, they may have a cutoff. They may say, if the probability of something happening is more than 10% or 20%, uh, I want to take those, each, of those, each of those answers as seriously. So for example, you know, imagine that you are doing a test, a medical test, 
it is testing for many diseases, right? And uh, suppose two of the probabilities, one is for some form of cancer, right? And is one is for another form of cancer. Both of them, they show probabilities in excess of, uh, let us say 10%, right? One shows a probability of 25% and another shows a probability of 10%. And then the other 30, 40 diseases, they show very, very little small probabilities, right? Or the rest 100 diseases show very small probabilities. But the fact that two of them are amplified uh, relative to others, it is cause for you to be alarmed, isn't it? You would say, well, let's go and do more tests just to be sure. Do you get that? So you don't want to just pick the biggest one. You want to have a relative sense of proportion, which probabilities give you. All right, yes, got it. Right. And it gives you a way to cut off, do cutoffs. Uh, if you remember in, Sci, uh, in uh, SK Learn, we had uh, the, the scikit Learn, we used to get the prediction, right? And we used to also get the predict proba. You remember probability, predict the probability of it being a cow or duck or horse or something. So quite often, actually, you not only care for what you're predicting it uh, and a thing to be, but you also are caring about um, how strongly do you believe in that? Right? So I'll give you a, a thing actually from uh, today itself in uh, my work. We were do looking at some text Given the text, we had to identify which subject are we talking about, right? Uh, are we talking about, uh, let me just say, uh, personal development? Or are, we, are we talking about uh, you know, uh, productivity tools or something like that? So then a question comes, when we, we notice that when the probability, uh, so suppose it predicts that it is um, a personal development, Right? And let's say that the probability that it comes up with is 65% or 70%. By then you're pretty sure. And let's say that the second best is around 6%. And then it goes downhill. After that, other things are much less probable. You're reasonably sure that this text that you're looking at is about personal development or one of these things that people keep getting as trainings in workplaces. Uh, productivity. And so, so then on the other hand, if you get another piece of text and it talks about, let's say, uh, two subjects, uh, let, let's not name, maybe, okay, let's say that it's a little bit about team management, right, and uh, emotional intelligence or something like that. But they both develop 30, like 35% and 30% probability. The highest one is, let's say, a team management. The second highest one, just a little bit behind, is, uh, let's say, at 30%. You realize that the game has changed now. You're not so sure. It could possibly be that one is not winning over the other by a huge margin. So uh, what your right approach should be that you ascribe this thing, and in our case, it was valid to do that. You ascribe this text to both, both the subjects. You say that it contributes to both the subjects, right? So when uh, it, it, there is enough information in it to belong to both the subjects. Uh, Asif. Yeah, go ahead. I have one question. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're talking about probab uh, probabilities over here, over here, which are summing to one, right? Yes. But can we only use it when we know there are a fixed number of classes? Oh, yes, 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 of course. Remember, classification presumes a fixed number of classes always. You must establish a number of classes a priori. Okay, uh, but then you gave an example of disease. So let's say if we don't know what kind of disease is it, so will still it be useful to use it in that case? See, here's the thing. There is a, such a thing as an ICD-9 code and I think there's ICD-11 code or something. There's a world standard international code for diseases, which has itemized exhaustively all the diseases we know about, including uncertainties, like we don't know what it is. Are we together? Yeah. 
So uh, it does exist and it's a pretty exhaustive list. If you ever go to a doctor and you, you get a physician and you get a, uh, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll hand out a blood test uh, thing for you. Now for ordinary blood tests, like, you know, annual checkup, it will probably not say anything. But if you do have a specific uh, chronic illness, if you look carefully on that uh, uh, blood test form, a lab work form, you'll see these ICD codes. It says that we are doing this special test and the justification for that is this patient has these diseases, which we are monitoring or managing, right? So that's how it goes. But if you are doing classification, you need to be exhaustive in what classes are there. What people do, quite often is that they have one placeholder class for none of the above, right? So suppose you're looking at a cow and a, a cow and a duck, but you expect some zebras to crop in to the picture. Zebras are there and, you know, I don't know, birds are there and for all, you know, buses and trucks and houses are there. And you want a classifier in which the only thing you care is, is there a cow, is there a duck? and others are irrelevant. So you might have a three, the three classes, cow, duck, irrelevant. Do you see how you can deal with it? In the irrelevant, everything else will fall. Okay, yeah. Thank you. So that could be one way that you would deal with it. So guys, uh, this was, I hope, a simple exercise. Uh, it is a preliminary to the topics that we'll deal with today. Was this easy? Now, can I move on to the next one? The next thing we'll talk about is again, quite simple, but we are building up the ground for something uh, important. Uh, let me use a different color here now, dot product. Those of you who took ML200 with me, remember the magical powers of the dot product. Remember the kernels and all of the things we talked about and all the tricks you can do. So dot products are actually quite interesting things. And a lot of machine learning can be reformulated, believe it or not, as uh, in terms of dot products of things, right? And that's, that's quite an quite a interesting thought. And it turns out that when we, today the things that we are going to deal with, the transformer, et cetera, they are uh, very, very much in there. So what does dot product do? Suppose you have a vector in some feature space, right? So let me use another color for this vector now. Suppose you have a vector here, A, right? And you have another vector, B, and you have another vector, C, another vector, D. If you did the dot product of A, dot b, which I also write, if you notice, I use this notation, this a dot b. And uh, what you will notice is that a dot b, a dot c, um, a dot d, you will observe something very interesting. This will be a positive number. This will be approximately zero. And this will be right, a negative number. Right. So uh, what it means is that when you take the dot product, it tells you how aligned the vector B, uh, some other reference vector, some vector is with respect to a reference vector. So suppose you treat A as a reference vector. Now you take any vector let's say it is xi, x vector, when you do a dot x, right? What you are telling, the, uh, the result here will tell you how aligned x is to a. Are we together? And this becomes even more pronounced if I take the dot product and I also divide it by the magnitudes of these. This, is, this becomes the so-called cosine similarity, cosine similarity, it is literally, as this is the angle theta, then cosine theta is this, between the x vector and a, let's say is the reference. And in particular, when two vectors are perpendicular to each other, what happens is that their, um, what will happen to their dot product? 
cosine of 2 what is the cosine of 90 degrees zero zero, zero. right so that is why i said this is zero close to zero and when the 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 dot product or when the cosine so here's the thing suppose i were to write cosines here implicitly cosine then this would be close to approximately plus one somewhere near that that's a little bit maybe 0 0.9 or something like that but this would be uh, eight this guy would lead to zero approximately uh, this would be approximately minus one close to minus one let's say 0 0.85 or something like that right so the values will go from minus one to plus one based on how aligned another vector is to a reference vector are we together always think of cosine as a measure of alignment between two things. If two things are very well aligned, they will have a good cosine. Otherwise, they will are a good dot product, positive dot product. If the two are not aligned, if they are perpendicular, they, they'll tend to have zero. Uh, and if they are anti-aligned, right, you would say that then it would be again a big number, but with a negative sign. So far, so good, guys, with this idea of transform, uh, with, sorry, cosines and dot products. Now we're building up. Huh? There, there are only one last piece of observation I'll make before we launch into what we are going to do. So let me use this other color now to this. So there is an observation. In random vectors, in high dimensional spaces, tend to be surprisingly, and this will surprise you, perpendicular to each other. How is that possible? So uh, let, me, let me give you an idea. So suppose you're doing a two-dimensional plane. So suppose I have a vector x and I have a vector y. Right? I take a random vector somewhere, y the chances or maybe uh, you can just pick a number somewhere or the other this right this and this maybe uh, i'll just take some number y right? there's some certain angle so let's do that you can write x made up of two components some random number and let's, let's take unit vectors for simplicity let us take unit vectors for simplicity yeah? so that we don't have to distinguish between the cosine and the dot product. Right? So now what happens is, suppose I take a number, some number, very small. Uh, you can pick a number between uh, minus one and one or something like that. And then, uh, or like unique vector, small vectors, and then some value here. So if you pick values here, uh, let us say that you pick what should I pick? 0 0.5, right? And here you ended up picking up uh, zero, or maybe you ended up picking up uh, minus 0 0.2. Then you have y, and then again, you pick up some value. So minus 0 0.3 and 0 0.7, right? Something like that. I'm, I'm randomly picking these two values. And now, See, and obviously uh, here I'm sort of contriving it. What will happen is when you do x dot y, you'll see that it is these two things multiplied. So minus, uh, let me make this a plus here. So this will be minus 0 0.15, 0 point, minus 0 0.15 plus, let us say 0 0.14. Right? So obviously here I'm uh, contriving it to make it look perpendicular. <laughs> so uh, anyway, it is, it, is, it is some number, right? Um, maybe let's not uh, be so clever. Uh, okay, you can pick whatever number you want. Uh, it will be something. But now when you take multiple dimensions, so suppose you have X vector made out of 100 components, right? What is the average value that uh, each of those components may have, right? You will realize that if you have to have unit vectors, you'll have to do one over 10 approximately, uh, one over 100, let's say that uh, one over 100, one over 100. The, the average in each of the columns will be when you pick a vector one over 100 and so on and so forth. 
right? Now what will happen is, if you take a unit vector, so let us say that uh, by chance, a unit vector is along, uh, aligned along this axis and the other, other vector is along some other axis. Actually, the better way to motivate it is, think like this, if you take a vector, which is in this plane, in the horizontal plane, Now you take any other vector, guys, what is the likelihood that that vector will fall in the same plane? Relatively low, right? One by three. Right, so you expect that the other vector may go, for example, like this, or it may go like this. Correct. Isn't it? And so if you look at it, the angle that you subtend between these, they already begin to look sort of uh, not close to zero. They, they seem to be uh, extending a pretty big angle. It's very unlikely that it will be exactly the opposite in the other direction of the plane. It will just be off the plane. When it is off the plane, it, it will be almost nearly orthogonal. Uh, in three dimensions, uh, already you can see the effect, but when you have many, many dimensions, so imagine that these are all the dimensions. Right? So if in all of these dimensions, if one vector is like this and the other vector is like this, what you will gradually begin to see is that they are ortho, uh, that they are orthogonal to each other, right? So we and uh, when we can do this with a little bit of Python code, it's fun to actually see that this works. Right? Now I can give a more mathematically rigorous answer, but let's stay with the hand waving arguments here. So uh, the conclusion we are saying is in higher dimensional space, most, dot, most pairs of vectors, pairs of random vectors, vectors will, will tend to be almost orthogonal. So now, now look at this. Most, I use the word most, not always. And I, and I just say tend to, means there will still be a situation by randomness that uh, two vectors may just be aligned, or almost aligned. But it is far more likely that they will be orthogonal to each other. So far so good guys. So from yeah. this, we have uh, three facts. First is we understand what uh, softmax is and why it should, should have been called arc softmax. The second thing we have is we understand dot products, what they do. They show you the alignment between two vectors. And the third observation, which is a bit startling because you haven't thought about it. Usually you don't notice it, but it is true that in higher dimension spaces, you take two random vectors and they'll tend to be perpendicular to each other or nearly perpendicular to each other, right? So this is food for thought. Think about this on your own, right? And uh, in maybe when we are doing the next lab, I will show it to you, but today uh, in the interest of time, I'd like to move forward. So we will take these three facts with us and launch into today's very interesting topic of transformers. Um, but before that, we'll do RNN. So let me write it down. Three things we learned was softmax number one. The number two that we learned was dot product that it measures alignment, right? Measures alignment. Number three is that random pairs of vectors in high dimension dim. And then uh, since it is machine learning, we can put it, uh, so let me just use the word uh, high dimensional spaces tend to be orthogonal, i.e. x, y, random values will be, will tend to be zero. So these are our three uh, takeaways from this mathematical preliminaries for today. Asif, is that an assumption, the third one, or can be mathematically proved? Oh, it can be very rigorously proved. Okay. 
Yeah. And the argument is there, but I, uh, it will take us a little bit of time. Uh, the argument is uh, like to prove it rigorously, uh, it is actually a theorem and it's a little bit involved. So stay with hand-waving arguments. That's good. What is the theorem called? Um, well, it is literally, it doesn't have a name, but it just says that random vectors in high dimensions are, uh, are uh, very likely to be orthogonal. All right. Um, Saturday, remind me, if you get time, right? I'll, uh, those of you who love the mathematics of it, I'll give you guys a rigorous proof. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so Asif, uh, so the softmax, uh, so is that the same concept as the like distillation? Like the Jeffrey Hinton paper, like in like 2000, like earlier initial paper, uh, which talks about like knowledge distillation. So is it like the same or similar concept? Actually, I, it's been a while since I read that paper. So I'm a little bit hesitant to, uh, the 2006 paper you're referring to, right? Oh, uh, uh, yes. Yeah, so no, uh, it, it's been a while. I'd have to go back and look at it. Good question. Uh, okay. Yeah, so uh, that one, I don't remember actually. So I'll have to look whether he's saying the same thing. It is possible, I don't know. Okay. So, um, all right, so, so now we come to the sequence models. So here I'm eating up a lot of things, which we will do in great detail in the coming months. So uh, I'm sort of hopping through the highlights of a big field here. So the way you do sequence models is this. Imagine that you have a thinker, think about a thinker. Thinker who has, and this is my intuition. So uh, you won't find this in textbooks. It's my uh, just uh, idiosyncratic way of thinking about it. Who has a thought, thought in her mind, right? And what the thinker tries to do is you, you say something to the thinker and it tries to distillate or get the essence of it and hold on to it, some abstract form of it, right? So suppose you say the, the cow after eating the carrots, it's a silly statement. I suppose uh, my way of thinking itself is a little uh, like this. So this, gets into the same genre. The cow, after eating a lot of carrots, a lot of carrots, jumped over the moon So it, I will even modify it a little bit. was if you like, was was happy and it jumped over the moon in delight, right? delight, in its delight. Crazy sentence, but I'm concocting this sentence just to uh, point it out. So what are we talking about? The main subject of this uh, thing seems to be the cow, isn't it? The cow is up to all sorts of things. It's eating, it is eating carrots, it's feeling happy, it ju is jumping over the moon in delight and so forth, right? So this is a thought vector. So now let's Im imagine how a, a thinker is responding. You said the cow. So just think how a thinker, if it is a machine, what would it do? in order to hold the information that you have uh, in, in its mind. So first of all, you give it, let's say, the cow. Huh? You say, the, you feed it the word, uh, let me just write it like this. You feed it the word, the, uh, I'll just write some part of the sentence, huh? the cow after eating a lot of carrots. So think about this thinker who I will just replicate. So what happens is you feed it this word, the, 
right? Now, what this thinker can do is to say, hmm, okay. It's holding something in its mind, right? So let us say that it, what it is holding in its mind is H1, right? Now you say cow. The next word is cow. Now it needs to think something, but whatever it thinks, the next uh, sort of a thought that it has, which captures what it has heard so far, must include the, not, not just the the, but also, I mean, not just the cow, the second statement, let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It must not only hold or create the thought based on cow, but it that thought that it comes out with, would you agree that it must include the also, right? Likewise, now, so let me call it H2. Uh, after getting the second input, now you give it the, it will it will produce a bigger thought H3. But you would realize that the th if the the thought that the thinker is thinking only responds to the word after, it would be a rather meaningless thought. It would be far more relevant if it was this thought represented the essence of the cow after somehow. And this represented the cow. And this represented the, right? And likewise, you can keep going on. I'll just uh, draw, draw this. So the next thought that you produce, it somehow takes the previous thought and it alters it, you know? It sort of adds something to it. Do you realize that? The thought is in, in some sense gradually forming, a more complex thought is gradually forming in the mind of the thinker, right? If the thinker were a person, this is how it would work. You know, just, just see how you listen to people and you'll realize that it is somewhat along these lines, isn't it? So now you have the coming in and whatever the hidden state was, what was it, H5 goes in and the response that it produces the thought that it thinks, which represents all that has gone in, would be like, for example, this should represent the cow after eating a lot. It should contain this much, the cow after eating a lot. Somehow that much of thought must be captured in, uh, uh, like the essence should be there in the thought of the thinker. Am I making sense, guys? I'm saying something very simple, that if your job is to somehow uh, hold whatever you are told as a thought in your mind, then you have to pay attention to what has been said so far and the next word that you, have, you, you hear. Right? And you have to process it all in your mind to uh, create a sort of a, a representation of that sentence. Am I making sense, guys? Yes. Something very obvious, right? So now what happens is at the end of it, when you get the last word, uh, and so, so suppose here it is the delight, and then followed by a full stop, right? When it finally gets, and so now here, whatever final thought comes out, it should somehow encode the entire thought, right? The entire thing that it has heard, it should, somehow be able to represent it, right? So one, one very obvious way that you can think of is what it will do is it will literally memorize whatever it has heard. And the thought here is nothing but the entire sentence exactly as it is, isn't it? So one easy way for you to is listen and just literally remember it as it is, right? And uh, that would be okay because that's just a recording. But here comes the interesting magic here. What you do is you ask the machine. So suppose you're dealing with machines or, or just think of a thinker. You ask the thinker that see, I, I don't care whether you can literally regurgitate what you heard. What, we, what I want you to do is understand what you heard. And you focus on your thought should understand 
in some sense, what is it that you heard? Right. Now, understanding is different from just parroting or just being able to literally memorize, uh, memorizing the sentence or holding it in the mind. Yeah? Understanding means you got the essence of what was being said. And so if you really understood it, and if you could speak in two languages, for example, now I can ask you, well, why don't you now say that thing in uh, French? Do you see the difference? Right? You're, you're saying if you really understood rather than just memorized, can you uh, reproduce that in French? And you then the translation into French will emerge not by a word to word translation from the initial text, but it will be derived from your understanding of the text. Isn't it? And that's how you do translation. Imagine a translated. What do they do? They hear a sentence and then they understand that sentence, what was said, and then they translate that into a different language. And the, obviously when they translate, the words, the words are, are not literally in the same sequence, but they make sense in the other language. Are we together, guys? Yes, sir. So that is the crucial difference. We are saying when you hold that thought, that thought should represent your understanding of what you have received so far. Right? And the word that people use uh, is uh, multiple. I have seen people use the thought vector. Uh, I like to use the word that what finally here is that it is a thought vector. Vector is simply because uh, obviously it's, a, it's information, it's a data structure, it is numbers. So it will ultimately be some numbers because in machine learning, everything is numbers, right? But somehow this thought vector should be an understanding of the input sequence, right? This is important. We are not saying just literally reproduce the input statement, but understand it. So how do you make it understand it? The way you do that is, and this is classic machine learning, you don't give it enough memory to just memorize the whole sentence, right? You, you give it very limited memory, right? The, the size of this vector is limited. Let us say that it is 1024 uh, nodes neural network nodes, right? So you have a neural network. So what happens is that every time a new word comes, it goes and updates the weights associated with all of these. Are we together? Right, the, out, the output, sorry, activations, A1, A2, A3. They check, so the activation result that you get, output is the earth thought vector, it is your HI, right? When input I goes in, what happens is it goes through this neural network. Let's say it has one, zero, two, four nodes, and then it produces these activations. Those activations as a vector is your hidden thought. Now you say, well, uh, how would it know? Act Suppose you're using some activation function, uh, maybe uh, ReLU or, um, I don't know, tan H, whatever, doesn't matter. The important thing is you need to know what the weights are, W1, et cetera, et cetera, for all of these, right? For an input word, uh, ultimately what the weights are. So what will happen is as you um, keep on, so suppose you, it has certain weights, you don't know what they are. You put in the first word, it creates one thought vector. Now you comes to another word, H1. So it will become like this, H1 goes to H2, goes to H3, goes to H final. Do you see that guys? Huh? Because what you're doing is <clears throat> you're, you're passing it word by word and you're keeping track of the activation with one difference. What are you doing? You're not just feeding it the input. You are taking this activation of the previous Before the next word comes, so let's say that uh, when, when input I goes in, into this neural network, you not only feed the input, 
you also feed the thought so far, right? The thought vector so far, generated so far. And so this plus this produces the next thought, thought vector. Right? The word people often use in literature is, uh, I have seen, they usually call context vectors. Context vector, and uh, some people like me call it a thought vector, a thought vector, or just context or thought. It is the thought behind the sentence. Are we together? Or another way to think of it is, it is the essence or understanding of the sequence, right? And now uh, when I generalize from a word to sentence, a sentence and words to sequence, I now uh, could also be talking about <coughs> any time series data, right? So for example, you may be feeding in the temperature data um, across different hours of the day for a whole year. And now it should have some understanding of the seasonality. So that if you say, go predict the temperatures, the noontime temperatures for the next uh, three months, it should be able to produce something that approximates what will happen, right? Or what is there. Are we, are, we, are we together here so far? And the interesting thing to know is that, see, what is happening is, if you really think about this uh, neural net, uh, this neural net here, I'm writing it, and so it has all of these nodes inside it. There are two things that go into it. One is, in the beginning, of course, it will be your first word, W1. Right, and uh, there is no hidden thought here, so you can pass it, uh, not uh, just a, you know, placeholder H zero thought, blank thought. Then these two inputs going into the network produces the the thought that comes out of studying or uh, learning the word one. Now there is another thing. Sometimes this neural network, not only you do this, uh, you may just have an output one you may ask for some output also, right, from the neural network that uh, predicts something or whatever. Uh, so far, uh, is it a positive sentiment, negative sentiment, whatever it is, uh, you, you can pick some output. So now, in our case, uh, we don't focus on the output very much. This one, I will not focus on today. So now, how do we generate H2? What will happen is, it is the same box now you have taken this, or actually, let me put it this way here. Uh, so people sometimes write it like this, H0, they both go in to produce H1. So the same thing, how do you do for word two? The same box now, what I need to do is feed it, let me write it, H1 and word two. And what will it produce? H2 in the same network. And now you have H2. So you take H2 and word, uh, sorry, H2 and word three, and you will get therefore H3. The H stands for the hidden state typically. So uh, you get this result, these activations, uh, right? And so you can keep going on till you get the word, the H final minus one, and the word final, which is the terminal character, let us say, and it will produce the, uh, let me use a different color just to make sure that um, uh, you realize that we are feeding it all into the same network. Uh, uh, let me do this. But I hope this idea is clear now, guys. Huh? F, H, F minus one, word final. It will produce, what will it produce? It will produce the, H final. Do you see that, guys? And this is the remarkable thing. You're not taking a many, many neural networks because you can't. Sentences are of arbitrary length. What you're doing is you're taking just that same neural networks, but you're feeding it the input and the output from the previous uh, sequence, you know, the previous, uh, the sequence so far. That's why it's recurrent. When Right, and that is, that is the root of the word recurrent, recurrent, recurrent 
neural net architecture. It's a recurrent neural net archi CGI texture. Gosh, my spelling is terrible today. Uh, architecture. Neural net architecture. So it's the neural, this particular form of uh, architecture for neural nets is called a recurrent neural net architecture, RNN. So Asif, yeah, go ahead. This, this uh, architecture will only stop once we are out of the words. Yes, uh, the moment you hit the last, the full stop, you're done. So it's not relate anything related to reducing loss function or anything in recurrent neural net. No, no, no. At this moment, all you're doing is you have just come up with the thought vector. You haven't done anything. So the, the training part is still there. Now we'll come to the training part in a moment. Oh, okay. So what you call okay. is, uh, you call this the encoder part of our encoder decoder. Decoder. So now, because see, I'm jumping along, you can use RNNs for many things, right? Uh, for example, if you really cared for the output, uh, then it could have been the sentiment of this of the sentence so far and whatnot. But I'll ignore it because what we are concerned, uh, so in your mind, a frame that the problem you're solving is machine translation. Because it will help you understand this situation better. Translation, right? Uh, from English to, now pick your language in the Spanish, Etc. etc. et cetera. So far so good guys, right? So the way we think about it is we unroll it. You, you unroll the, this diagram, this diagram, and you think of it not as, uh, even though it is the same neural net, you tend to draw it like this, H naught W1 produces H1, which gets fed into the same neural network, but it produces H2, right? And it keeps going on till you have H final minus one, word final, which is your stop word, right? A full stop or whatever it is. Are we together? Yes. No, more, no more inputs. And when you don't have any more inputs, whatever output you get, the final state is your thought vector. This is your final context or thought. vector. This hidden state now is a thought vector capturing hopefully the entire sentence or your temperature data or stock market data, whatever it is. Asif, now comes a question. Uh, hang on guys, hold on for a moment. Huh? Let me finish this thought. Hold your questions. Now comes the question that, uh, okay, what about decoding it? This is the encoder part, right? So this part here so far is called the encoder. Encoder, and I'll take questions in a moment, guys. And please just be patient. Encoder. What about decoding it? So you need then a decoder. Let me put decoder in another separate color just for fun. Uh, you need a decoder. What the decoder does is it takes the thought vector, H final, and its neural, its, its job is very interesting. In the beginning, you just put up you know, you just feed it some placeholder word, which is just the start. You know, you may have a token called start, saying the start of the output, start producing output. And what this should produce is the translation of the sentence. For example, uh, I will just put something in Hindi, and please forgive me if you don't understand Hindi, guy. And my spelling is atrocious, so most likely I'll spell it wrong. So uh, this vector goes in, you give it the start token and it produces one output, right? This is your output one, this is your uh, just input. And now what happens is, actually you don't feed it any input, forget about this input thing. You just give it this, you, you, uh, you do step one. It produces this, now it produces let me say the decoder, I'll just create the decoder step. So those were encoder, is it okay if I use the word decoder? So D1, right? You treat this as D0. Yeah. And you now ask this question, if I feed this into this network, uh, th this 
this thing, the next time I trigger it, what is it going to produce? So then it will produce an output O2. Let's say Chand. By the way, this guy means cow and Chan means moon, right? And let's say that you get D2 and then K, K Upper, uh, you know, now. Something like that. I'm just putting some Hindi words here. Uh, it will start producing different words. But the problem is, how do you train this encoder decoder? So you know that these are all neural networks. How do you train it? So training is actually very straightforward. It is the same back propagation, the same loss function. So what happens is that it produced, let's say that uh, this network was not trained at all. So this thought vector will be absolutely useless, isn't it? it will be some random uh, values. So you ask it to produce a word. What it will do is how will it produce a word? It will produce, uh, let's say that your final vocabulary, Hindi vocabulary has, uh, le let's say that the has, should we say 10K words? Roughly speaking, you can choose how many words you want to start with. So what will it do? The details are this guy, this box decoder, it is feeding it into, for output, it is feeding it into a soft max with how many values there? 10K words, right? So this will be word one, Hindi word one, right? HW1 Hindi word two, Hindi word three and so forth. Now what will happen when you feed it into softmax, you'll get your energies. Remember you, you will get the energy outputs. That's what we talked about in softmax, isn't it? Yeah. Right. And so out of these, one of them will have the highest probability. Hope, so a, a wrong one, let's say comes out with a high probability. Right, and the right one. Let's say that the cow, uh, the guy is sitting here. The the Hindi for uh, cow is sitting here, and this poor little uh, cow comes out with the probability is equal to zero point zero one, very low probability. What can you do now? Your data says that your label data says that your first word should have been guy, right? And uh, cow cow in Hindi, basically, a guy. But, uh, but something else came out. Let's say, uh, said, uh, let's say that a donkey came out as having the highest probability. And this is a mistaken. We don't want donkeys, we want cow, right? So how do we do that? Now, can we create a loss function? What can we do? We can say that this probability of the cow, if you take the negative log of the probability of the cow that you predicted is pretty low, isn't it guys? This turned out to be pretty low. Whatever it is, this is your loss. Because if this probability was one of the cow, what is log of one? Zero. 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 So there is no loss, isn't it? The loss would be zero. Log of one, let me just write it down. If prediction was perfect, log p cow is equal to one, log p cow would be zero, i, no loss, right? You can't do better than no loss. On the other hand, in this situation, but for, let's take an example, but for p is equal to 0 0.01, and let me cheat, let me take it to the base 10. It, it is actually to the base e, but uh, I'll cheat, right? Because I, I'm, I'm not, I can't mentally compute log to the base e, cheating. So using log 10, right? Should be, and I'll just put an, should be e. So, uh, but I'll just cheat. So what is it? This is equal to 10 to the minus two. So what is minus log 10 of uh, 
10 to the minus 2. Can you guys tell me what is it? Mm. This is equal to minus of minus 2 is equal to 2. A pretty significant loss. Right? It's a positive number. So in other words, because I made a wrong prediction, I have a significant amount of loss or error measure. And so for the next word and the next word and the next word, and so you can accumulate all the loss. And now once we have the loss, right? So this is your standard, let's say, uh, here I used, th this way of doing it is of course the cross entropy loss that we are used to uh, from ML200. And you could try out different log measure. It doesn't matter what log you took. But the important point is that suppose you have a log loss. What can you do now with this loss? You can do gradient descent and start updating all the weights, right? Because ultimately there's just only two networks here, this guy and this guy, because these the rest of them are just copies of this, right? I have just unrolled it out. You have to just look at the weights here and there. Am I making sense, guys? There's an encoder network and a decoder network. And I can do the using loss, using gradient descent on loss, backprop, and update weights in what? In encoder and decoder. Uh, obviously, uh, you have to feed it a lot of sentences, right? Uh, lots of data because each sentence is one data instance. So you'll have to give it a lot of label data. This sentence, the translation is this. This sentence, the translation is this. And so at each uh, mini batch of sentences that you give, now you can, or even just one sentence at a time, if you do stochastic, uh, you can now start computing loss and start doing gradient <coughs> back propagation and gradient descents. Am I making sense, guys? Right. So at the end of it, all these complications later, what do you really have? You have the encoder to which you're giving it a sequence. And then it, that goes, that creates a thought vector which goes into the decoder, which produces a translation. And you notice that I'm not using the same number. This is five and this could be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Because the, a different number of words might come out in a different language. So this is what you're doing, but each of these is nothing but um, neural net. And this is neural net one encoder. This is neural net decoder. So they are just filled with weights. Trainable weights and trainable weights and biases, right? Same here, isn't it? And because they're just filled with weights and uh, trainable weights and biases, what it means is that so long as, so number one, you compute the loss and the same loop of machine learning kicks in from there. How, how do we do that? we do a backward. Remember in PyTorch, you do a backward. It computes the backprop, the gradients. Backprop compute gradients. And then with respect to these uh, weights and biases. And number three, update. What is the delta rule for update? Again, any particular weight will get updated to the previous value of the weight minus alpha gradient of the loss with respect to the weight i. The same uh, machine learning that we are familiar with will take over. Okay. Are we together guys? This is the RNN architecture, it's very simple. Okay. Now comes the question that uh, what are, where does it work and where does it not work? It turns out that, and this has to go back to the Turing machine and how we think about it. Think like this, if the thought vector is limited, you know, for example, you have 128 nodes and their weights there, your thought vector is only of a finite size. Think of it as a person with a limited memory 
or understanding. What happens if you give it some simple input? It will do a pretty good job in translating it. Isn't it, guys? There's a three words you gave a sentence. How are you? And it will say, translate it into uh, another language pretty well. But gradually, as you make your input longer and longer, what happens is that the word that comes in the beginning, W1 and W final, see, gradually these things are there in the memory first. Then you extend it and extend it. Soon this place gets overwhelmed. So what happens is that the, the understanding gets biased towards recent words. Are we together? The thing that it heard last, it is much more able to remember or understand, but the understanding that it had of the sentence, the long sentence, the words in the beginning, they begin to get diluted. Uh, are we right? So let us illustrate that with our initial sentence that we took. Uh, and I deliberately took a long sentence. The cow, after eating a lot of carrots, was happy and it jumped over the moon in its delight. So what happens is by the time it reaches this, it's, it begins to forget what were, what were we talking about, right? So uh, there, there's, a, there's a lovely story, uh, you, you know, that uh, Finding Nemo for children. And uh, I believe there's a character, it is called Dora or Dory? Dory. Dory, Dory just keep swimming. Yes, yeah, she keeps him, and she has a very short memory. And there is a beautiful uh, sort of point, day in which uh, all her friends, uh, they are preparing to give her a surprise party, I suppose. And uh, she has no clue that it is a birthday. She's entirely forgotten it. Right? So she's seeing all of this uh, puzzling activity, but can't understand it. So it's a little bit like that. And so uh, these, uh, these recurrent neural networks, uh, they have a small memory, a small understanding. They are like Dory. And if you uh, say things too much in the past, a really long sentence, it begins to forget the beginning parts of the sentence. Right? That is a one way to understand it. Are we together? Right? So that is the limitation. Gradually, it begins to forget and starts making mistakes with longer sequences, whether it is sentences. And, and I use the word sentence more broadly. It could be time series data, any time series data. Right? Uh, if you uh, consider a sentence as also as a time series in words, think of any time series or any sequence. Uh, it long sequences, it begins to uh, forget the earlier parts of the sentence in its understanding. Uh, you know, it begins to fade out of the, the amount of understanding it has. Does that make sense, guys? Does it happen to us also? Somebody tells you a very long and com complicated story. We also have a, a very limited transactional memory. At the end of it, we remember what he said last. Right? Would anyone like to confess to that? Definitely true. Definitely, right? So this happens with machines too. So then the question came that this is your standard RNN. Can you improve upon it? So people try to- uh, One quick question before we move on. <laughs> so what you used here to frame the H and the, the boxes, that's a conceptual framework in terms of, you know, there's a thought that is getting built little by little, right? Yeah, and those thought is nothing but the activations of the, neural network sitting there. That box is a neural network. It's just the activation, the output activations of the neural network, so the hidden states. Okay. So in that sense, then these have to be, when we think of the underlying neural network that will model this, you yeah. need to have as many layers as you need to be, you know. The no, 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 no. That is the point. See, um, and let me emphasize that. So I did not do a good job then. Uh, hang on. See, take a simple one layer neural net if you want, 128, right? Or something, some amount. Huh? I'll just write it as 128, right? It's typically 256, 512, 1024, whatever, right? Uh, but let me, let me just simplify it, but to argue 
simplify it to simplify it to four, right? So let us say that you have one, two, three, four, right? And now what happens is you feed it a word. Let us say that the word, uh, every word can be represented by, um, let us say that you have a very simple vocabulary. A word can be represented by a 10 dimensional vector because you have only 10, 10 words in your vocabulary, all right? So your input is, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, right? This is the word that you are feeding, that any input, this is your input. This input will get to the hidden layer, uh, whatever, your standard dense, whatever uh, dense. So uh, what happens is, and then it will produce an output. So together it will produce an output. Now think about it. This guy can remember, or the context of this is limited, right? What you do is word one comes in, word one comes in. And by the way, the, the other thing you do is, so let me actually simplify it. Huh? So let's say that this is the word WI. And the rest of the notes that are, uh, rest of the information that is coming to this is actually coming from the H hidden state so far. That is there, and this is the hidden state output. So what you do is whatever hidden, the same thing. You're not making many layers of the neural network, just one layer, one hidden layer. Okay, yeah. You're just taking this and back feeding it. This is the recurrent part. Recurrent, recurrent word, right? It refers to the fact that you're taking the output and feeding it back as input along with the true input at each stage. So you have therefore one hidden layer. See, you can make it multiple hidden layers, but not because the sentences are long. Or, you know, this sentence, suppose the sentence has 10 words, doesn't mean you need a 10 layer hidden, uh, 10 hidden layers. It's not like that. It's the same. The hidden, number of hidden layers is independent of the input. Mm. It is your architecture. You pick your architecture. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's that. So in this, the problem really is that uh, it begins to forget, right? Or does forget its understanding of the earlier stuff, right? When you give it very log sequences. So let me write it down. Disadvantages. Um, ask sir, I have a question. Yes. Um, uh, I'm pretty confused with the input part and how the thought is generated. The question is on similar line how the, uh, you know, the gentleman just asked. So input is the whole sentence, not word by word, right, sir? No, you feed it word by word. That's the whole point. You first feed it the word one, it mm -hmm. comes out with a hidden state output, hidden state as H1 and some output O1, if you care about, right? That hidden state, think of it like this. Uh, some people draw this diagram like this uh, to emphasize that this also becomes W2 and H1 goes into it to produce H2 and the output two, if you want, the next hidden state, which you feed it back into the same guy. Let me call this guy X, is the same X network, huh? Okay. Yeah, that I was getting confused that is probably H is, X is different, but it is basically same X. It's the same X. You just unrolled it to, to explain it or to just understand it. Right? Which is why a lot of people, without unrolling, the diagram is typically mentioned like this. Okay. And one word at a time, it will keep feeding and keep uh, taking the intermediate, basically. Exactly. And so that is the sequential nature of it. Output. So <clears throat> let me say that again. Uh, what you do is you uh, feed it one input at a time in a sequence. You have a sequence of inputs, for example, sequence of words. You can't feed all of them to it at the same time. You have to feed it one at a time, right? And so that is its limit. So now let's uh, itemize its limitations of this architecture. RNNs are very powerful, actually. When they came about, there was an interesting thing, the unreasonable effectiveness of uh, RNNs, because it could do things. It could actually do translations and do many things. And a lot of people were very thrilled with it. 
right? Uh, it had its limit, and people felt that, you know, we can keep on improving the RNNs and get a lot of mileage out of it. They kept on trying, it kept getting better and better. So I'll just mention its limitations here. Uh, one more question, sir. Yeah. So the thought vector, that is not uh, that is a, not a gately sentence or word. It is just, you know, the, basically an abstract representation. Yeah, abstract representation, probably. Right. So uh, that's that. So now what are the limitations? First is, as you identified, need to feed the sequence one word at a time. Isn't it? As you can clearly see, right? One word at a time. And when the entire sentence goes in, then the output begins to come. No. Once entire sentence is in, then decoder starts decoding. Again, one translated word at a time. Example, in this case, one Hindi word. Uh, so the entire thing is sequential. Now, why is this a problem? It's a problem because if you, we live in the world of GPUs, you know, graphic computing units, uh, the video cards and so forth, the tensor processing units. These are massively parallel machines, right? These are vector processing engines. They can deal with a lot of computations in a parallel way. And so if you look at the, the computer, when we did the computer vision part and the convolutional neural net, we talked about the entire image going in at one go. We were not feeding it pixel by pixel, isn't it? And not only an entire image, in fact, a whole mini batch of images they were, we were doing a forward pass and a backward pass and one step included an entire mini batch of images all in one shot, right? One forward matrix multiplications, one, one gradient computation, one update step, right? Whereas with RNN, the first thing that hits you is that this is tedious. You can't feed it a mini batch of sentences. You have to feed it, not only that, even a sentence, you can't just feed the whole of it. You have to feed it one word at a time, right? Until it hits the end of the sentence and then the output will come. So obviously the, in the natural language processing community, people were very concerned that the translations are very slow, right? Uh, relative to the extreme computational uh, performance with images language translations are very slow and you can see why, right? The other problem that we said is the Dory problem, the, I call it the Dory problem. It tends to forget, tends to forget about the earlier Forget or fade, fade the earlier parts of a long sequence, right? So uh, there is a British author that used to be there. There was rather, uh, I don't know if you have heard the name of Francis Bacon. Okay. Uh, in, uh, and you know, we, as in India, uh, we were ruled by the Brits, so we read a lot of those British books and British authors uh, in my generation. Uh, I don't think we do that anymore. But <coughs> Francis Bacon is one of the Brits, uh, British authors of the previous century, or actually, the, I don't know, the, maybe the 19th century. So <coughs> he wrote his books. I remember encountering a sentence which started, was it Bacon or was it Maculay? I forget, we have either written Bacon or Maculay, another writer. It started in one page. It filled the entire page and most of the next page. And that was just one sentence, right? So you realize that that sentence is extraordinarily long. And when you try to feed that sort of sentences for translation, uh, the recurrent neural networks tend to do a pretty poor job.
right? the, the, so then people began to say, can we uh, solve or do something to make these recurrent neural networks better? So what they did is something quite interesting. They came variant of, within the same recurrent neural network family, they came first the so-called LSTM. Right. And I invite you to find the full form of LSTM. It's very interesting. It's sort of a, it sounds almost like a oxymoron. So I'll let you figure it out what it is. Right. And uh, so what it uh, does is- Long short term memory. Yes. So it's a, uh, you see that, right? So, but uh, anyway, Anil, you knew that she shouldn't have spoken up. I wanted people to go uh, search for it, but okay, long shot. <laughs> the long shot, you, you see how contradictory it looks. What it does is it contains basically uh, three components. One to remember, these are called gates. It remembers some things. One to unremember or forget. And one that we are doing update, you know, update the thought vector. And these three interact. What it means is, see, uh, when you hold the context, after some time, you can forget about it. You know, uh, that particular little bit of information from the beginning of the sentence, exactly when can you forget about it? There may come a time when you can forget about it. So it is, uh, the, these. I won't go too much into it because the architecture is a little bit complicated. These are the gates here, three gates. And when the inputs or the sequences flow through that, uh, all it, it, it's a collaboration between the remember, forget, and update gates that helps you uh, create the thought vector and then produce the output. Are we together? Am I making sense, guys? I won't go too much into detail, but it is essentially the same RNN thinking, a sequence in, a thought out, a context out, right? So encoder, and you would put another one of these and then this would be a decoder, right? Translation, text. So you could, I mean, in this particular case, sequence to sequence model, uh, the thinking is exactly the same. It's just that you can make it a little bit smarter so it can remember things, right? Then came another architecture, which was simpler, which is more recent which is GRU. So I'm deliberately not doing it because we'll do it perhaps in more detail later on when we do that uh, more in-depth part, which sort of gets forgets about the forget. It says forget the forget and let's remember and get, do with that in the update and that is good enough. Now, the functionality of in some sense forget is subsumed in the update. And so GRU is a simpler, is simpler and faster than LSTM, right? So, uh, <coughs> that is it. And I invite you to find the full form of GRU either also. So these are the architectures, but see, the good thing is that they were evolutionarily improving. They're doing better and better things. And then people in parallel, there was a new architecture coming about called the attention. Right. And so now I would like to go into the next part. So let's say that we'll end here. This is end of part one.